coming uh, on uh, semio uh, semiotica. And this article was written actually as a, in collaboration with uh, Nelly, who is also here present. And so um, you can consider basically the work here as a combination of our uh, efforts. And I will now share my screen um, because I prepared some slides. Maybe it makes it, makes it easier for you to follow my, uh, my thought process. And so um, one of the things that I try to do in my uh, PhD uh, dissertation is to use the Umwelt Kant model uh, developed by UX school uh, as a um, tool to uh, analyze and study social uh, communication. And one of the uh, problems uh, when analyzing uh, social communication is that we need to take into consideration uh, different uh, actors, different communicators, uh, all of which have uh, come, in a sense, uh, ha have a different umwelt or a different uh, subjective world. Uh, and uh, there are also some elements that escape the present situation, especially in the case of higher species that um, are not always taken into account by the Umwelt model, uh, model as it's uh, been conceived, uh, let's say, by the author. But before I go into that um, more specifically, my, uh, our goal was to develop, uh, to use, as I mentioned, the uh, model to analyze social communication and to develop uh, a way to use the uh, Umwelt model and the functional circle as a practical tool to analyze or describe social communication of animals with more complex Umwelt. And in our case, great apes. Um, now, one of the um, uh, core features of the Umwelt, uh, as you probably know, is the functional circle that can be understood as a basic, a basic model of um, semiosis or how meaning is generated uh, and why we um, uh, actually why won't we want to uh, use the Umwelt model in the first place to analyze social communication is that it allows uh, researchers to uh, take a uh, emic perspective into the lives of other creatures therefore um, in a sense, leaving aside a more anthropocentric and anthropomorphic uh, approach. Um, the functional circle, as I was mentioning, is the uh, basic unit of construction of the uh, of an umbelt. And Duke School himself had um, uh, uh, had pointed out that there are four basic functional circles or cycles, depending on the translation: uh, medium, food, anim enemy, and partner. And um, uh, if you remember the uh, example of the tick, uh, which is often brought up, uh, it's quite easy in a sense with uh, uh, animals with simple umwelt to describe very uh, precisely uh, the functional circle and in a sense break it down and have a clear picture of what's happening. But um, with animals with more complex umwelt, and this is not always uh, the case because first of all, there are individual uh, differences that uh, make the analysis much more complicated. And another feature that uh, um, characterizes uh, animals with more complex umwelt is that uh, there is a co uh, occurrence and simultaneity of functional circles, meaning that many and different functional circles are happening at the same time. And uh, this makes, um, again, the analysis, at least for, from the point of view of a researcher, much more complex. Um, the, func the functional circle and the Umwelt model were not, uh, I need to stress that they were not uh, conceived to analyze communication at all. They are models of, uh, uh, semiotic models that are, um, that is a semiotic model that is, does not always make a clear distinction between um, act of perception and uh, act of communication. And such limitations have already been studied and uh, approached by previous, uh, in previous literature. Um, so for example, uh, Rien Magnus and Kalevikul uh, have uh, stressed the fact that 
uh, there is not a successful distinction between, as I mentioned, actual perception and communication, but also other criticism has, uh, um, uh, in a sense, stressed uh, the, the fact that uh, the um, umwelt um, of more uh, complicated, uh, more uh, animals with more complex umwelt, sorry, uh, do not solely rely uh, rely in the construction of the uh, world on uh, perception and action organs, but there are some elements that uh, um, go beyond this. For example, spatial and temporal aspects of meaning making that also influence signification of functional circles. So uh, there is for elements of memory, anticipation, and so on that uh, are not explicitly represented in the uh, in the model as it's originally conceived. Um, moreover, the uh, animals with more complex species um, were in a sense, uh, sorry, animals with more complex umbelt and were already uh, in a sense um, acknowledged, uh, their difference was already acknowledged by school who uh, wrote that it grows within the individual lifespan of every animal that is able to gather experiences, the umwelt, for each new experience entails a readjustment to new impressions, thus new perceptual images with new functional tones are created. Uh, so uh, as, let's say a core idea of this is already present in uh, uh, school's work. Uh, but the Umwelt uh, model has been expanded by some authors already for the purpose of an, a communication analysis of a, the analysis of communication. One of these is Burger, Burgert, who has developed uh, this functional circle here that you can see in the picture. And uh, here you can see um, it includes two um, organisms that enter in a dyadic relationship and they are interacted through uh, an object or communicating about an object. It is in a sense a uh, updated version of the functional circle where two subject umwelter, uh, umwelter enter in contact and the subject interact and communicate through and again uh, or about an object. But this model presents some limitations because of the fact that it sort of schematizes as a one type of communication that happens through uh, the mediation of an object. So uh, another uh, development was that of Ignacy Ribo instead, who does not um, only take into account this type of communication. Uh, and he calls this model the semiotic al uh, alignment model. Uh, in this model, instead, the uh, communication is represented as a dialogue between two organisms. And the um, core uh, idea is that if communication is successful, there is a uh, alignment of two Umwelten that is the result of the interaction. Um, the model, as the previous one by Burgert, uh, they retain this cyclical idea of communication or feedback uh, loop, in a sense, um, where you can mostly distinguish between a sender and a receiver or in the sense in the case of uh, cyclical models the two roles are alternating where basically the two communicators are once they are senders and the other time they are receiver uh, this is one of the limits of many of the communication models that we have found that are either linear so that in, uh, understand communication as a transmission of messages between a sender or receiver or cyclical which is sort of a development or linear model where the roles are alternating. But uh, in our research, we have found uh, an alternative to this. And this is by the, uh, it was in the work of um, Barlund, who was a uh, communication expert, an uh, American communication expert. And he um, came up with the, uh, one of the most complicated models of communication that is known as the transactional model of communication. Uh, which was the purpose of which was to uh, analyze and treat the different variables that uh, enter into play when analyzing uh, social communication. And one of the key features of the uh, model is that it includes the understanding of communication as a dynamic and continuous uh, process. And communication is understood as uh, uh, unrepeatable and irreversible. 
um, unlike the cyclical models and uh, linear models, there is not a clear distinction, a distinction between sender and receiver. The, uh, as a matter of fact, we mostly speak of communicators, uh, where basically all the partners have uh, simultaneously both roles, so there is no alternation either. And here you can see a representation of the model is a very complex model, but uh, basically what we need to take into account uh, in this model and what we found very interesting is the fact that Panlund distinguishes between different cues that influence the communication process. And here, uh, some of them, the CPUs or public cues that are available to all communicators, so they are available to um they are basically environmental cues in a sense uh, that are uh, accessible to everybody private cues as the name suggests are only accessible to some of the communicators or one of the communicators communicators and um we can think about for example uh, memories that are only personal or internal states like hunger feeling of cold and so on that will impact the way that meaning is interpreted in the communication process then barno distinguished between uh, behavioral cues and among this he distinguished between non-verbal cues uh, and behavioral cues that are instead verbal well, verbal ones, language, that he understood as simply behavioral cues, and non-verbal cues, body posture, uh, gesture, and anything else that influences communication, and it is not verbal in a sense, but that comes from the subject himself. Now, what we did is that we um, elaborated the model so that we could, in a sense, use it uh, to analyze um, communication of other species. The first thing we did is to um, su uh, substitute the person that Barlod um, basically was talking about with subject so that uh, we would, in a sense, avoid a conflict with understanding of personhood when talking about other animals and in accordance with uh, Uxkul and uh, the Umwelt theory. Um, and this includes basically the acknowledgement of the role played by species-specific uh, perceptual and effector organs of the subject, as well as the modeling capacities that are provided by the inner belt or internal world of the organism. Uh, moreover, what we did is that we, uh, when we expanded the model, we um, tried to include the Umwelt theory and we envisioned communication as a process, um, a communicative communi sorry, the communicative process is a type of functional circle uh, where two or more subjects are interacting and creating meaning, which is a core aspect of this model itself, where meaning is not understood as something that is transferred, but something that is created in social interaction. So um, behavioral cues, um, if, we, uh, if we try to include the Umwelt model in the analysis of the communicative process, what we did is that we understood the behavioral cues as the uh, repertoire that is impacted in a sense influenced by the umwelt of the species and the um, physiology of the organism um, and this includes therefore all the gesture body movements chemical and vocal cues depending on the species uh, public cues that uh, I, was, I was mentioning are available to all participants perceptual field they are um, uh, in generally, they are uh, also influenced by the umwelt of the species in a sense because the way that uh, uh, each species will uh, give uh, meaning to each uh, environmental cue depends on the uh, repertoire of the species the, uh, and uh, on the perceptual effector organs of the species. And um, in addition to these individual factors need also be considered, especially in the case of uh, species with more complex zoom well then and uh, as for private cues um, as I mentioned these are uh, things that are available to only one of the participants uh, or one of the communicators and belong only to the phenomenological world of one of them uh, but uh, we took into account the fact that private and CPUs uh, and public use are not in a sense 
uh, exclusively um, private or exclusively public, but there is a possibility of uh, transformation from one to the other. And this transformation happens through uh, behavioral cues uh, of the of the subject. Finally, we also included the uh, context that usually uh, answers the question of what's going on here. And um, mm, the context is influenced by uh, the uh, species specific uh, uh, Umwelt construction in a sense. And um, mm, just to conclude, because I don't have much time, the uh, modified uh, model is uh, used to describe and an analyze intraspecific communication in our case, uh, where the Umwelt uh, similarity is uh, quite prominent. But we have also tried to uh, think about how to use the model to analyze interspecies communication, where the Umwelt of the species is not as similar, uh, therefore overlap is much more modest. And here what needs to be stressed is basically to what extent different cues will influence communication process and to what extent these cues are interpreted similarly by each species. Uh, in our model, the uh, differences of UMET is uh, represented by a decrease of the amount of CPUs, so public cues that are available to everybody, and increased amount of CPRs, therefore cues that have assigned meaning uh, by each subject individually. Uh, the amount of C behavioral cues is also impacted by the proximity of Umwelt because basically they will be interpreted uh, by each subject, uh, basically um, depending on how close their Umwelt is and how, uh, in a sense, how understandable these behavioral cues are for different species. And um, behavioral cues that cannot be decoded by one party will either have a different meaning and or not meaning at all. Um, so uh, these are things that we uh, have to consider for the development of uh, the model in the case of interspecies communication. But because I don't have much more time, uh, I would leave it to questions if you have any so that I could uh, explain uh, further uh, something more if needed. Since there aren't any questions, I might just add one thing that uh, though this was a th mostly theoretical paper, uh, we were also annoyed how, how usually how theories when they are presented, then they don't get applied. You know, you have like, for example, CBOX uh, communication platform, which, which is taught all over uh, the world uh, in soil semiotics uh, actually does not get applied. So we have also an empirical part in this paper where we take um, a case study uh, of chimps uh, grooming and try to analyze it through this model. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, okay. So if uh, you don't have any further questions, I would say that we can move to the next presenter, who is my friend and colleague, Nelly McEvey. And her presentation is titled Communication between Local People and the European Mink Analysis, uh, Analyzing Umwelt rever Reversion. And the floor is yours, Nelly. Uh, thank you, but I need you to stop sharing the screen. Yes, so I, could... I, I will <laughs> do it now. OK, let me see if I can do it now. Um... So I think you can you can see the slides. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Um, so my topic concentrates on animal behavior and the alterations that uh, take place when uh, when the environment uh, changes drastically. And I will also be employing the concept of Umwelt. Uh, thank you, Mirko, for for doing the hard work for me, so I can uh, save some time uh, and don't have to introduce all the uh, all the concepts. Uh, but I want to show how the behavior of the European mink change when they are reintroduced from ex situ, so from the zoological garden uh, of Talon, Talon Zoological Garden to uh, in situ uh, Hiuma, their uh, previous natural habitat. And I'll, I will show the um, information gathered from local people uh, with no science background can actually provide valuable knowledge. Uh, 
uh, on the behavior of these animals. So this kind of shifts the knowledge hierarchy uh, which we have in, in Western society where we believe scientific, uh, scientific discoveries and kind of discard this kind of local ecological no knowledge. Uh, to set the scene in this uh, very limited time frame, um, uh, it suffices to say that uh, me and my colleagues interviewed uh, 95 people uh, in Hiuma. Uh, Hiuma, I think you can see this is Estonia and the uh, upper left island is Hiuma. Uh, so uh, the, the main aim of this, uh, this uh, field work was to uh, pinpoint how the locals have adjusted since the mink has been reintroduced there since the year 2000. Uh, but there were several interviewees who gave us valuable knowledge uh, about the behavior of the mink. And these interviews together with the scientific li literature will uh, provide support for our Umwelt analysis. And it also suffices to say that uh, the captive conditions and in situ conditions of the highly endangered animal differed tremendously. Um, I will not go into details here. I would maybe like you to take some attention about the diet to see that the diet of the uh, in situ mink composes of mainly fish, uh, crustaceans, amphibians, but also small mammals like water voles, birds and insects. Uh, and also the other factor which I would uh, like you to pay attention to is, is the communication that they have with humans. So they are nocturnal, which means that they have very little contact with people and they are very sensitive to anthropogenic disturbances. If I won't have the time to talk about this uh, human-animal relationship, then I will only concentrate on the, on the functional circle of food. Uh, but this information about the life of the in situ European mink becomes relevant in comparison to minks living ex situ. So uh, again, the food minks are fed once a day with defrosted rodents, fish, chicks, minced meat uh, with uh, supplemental vitamins uh, and occasional live prey. And the contact, although it's kept to a minimum, only for necessary husbandry, at least for the animals who are, uh, are being reintroduced, uh, they are mostly uh, diurnal uh, in, in captivity because all these kind of husbandry activities take place during the, during the day. So I won't go into the main concepts of Umwelt and Functional Circle because Mirko did that for me, uh, but I would like to say that, um, that although uh, Umwelt is used to describe the subjective reality of, of the subject and uh, we are not able to directly access uh, the internal subjective state of an ally animal through Umwelt, it is still a tool that affords us with uh, accurate estimation based on the physical buildup of the animal. And also I think that Martinelli, who discusses the aspect of attaining an emic perspective instead of settling for an ethic perspective or, of a researcher supports this idea. So he thinks that, that uh, we can scientifically study the sensorial organs of animals and the way that organism interacts with the environment is largely due to the way that she or he perceives it. Um, so this approach where we employ the knowledge from the natural sciences enables us to map or model the subjective realities of allo, allo animals under observation. And as for the uh, functional circle, as Mirko said, there are four main functional circles um, and uh, the tie between, uh, between the organism and, and the object is not mechanistic. So there is a dynamic relationship between uh, perception and action. Uh, they are not, animals are not passive recipients or, or observants. And although Uxkul, yes, discussed the fact that some allo animals have more complex umwelt than others, um, we, will, we will discuss uh, only the, probably only the uh, food functional cycle in our, or circle in our case study. Uh, but I would <clears throat> briefly stop on the meaning carrier and just say that the object that the, that the animal perceives or acts upon uh, within a functional circle, uh, when it attains meaning, it becomes a meaning carrier. This means that all the objects in the umwelt of an animal are selected and interpreted in a, spe uh, in a specific purpose. 
so allo animals do not enter into relationships with neutral objects, but they are immediately transformed into meaning carriers uh, due to the meaning imprinted them by the subject. One object can have several meanings, uh, like food and shelter, and, at this, and the same meaning can be attributed to different objects, for example, an object of play. And this is, uh, I think, in correlation with the complexity of the allo animal Zumwalt. Uh, Uxkri stated that the amount of meaning carriers for the allo animal may increase during their lifetime. Uh, and this act, aspect of change that can take place in allo animal Zumwalt and through incorporating new meaning carriers or reconfiguring existing meaning relations and forming new functional circles is crucial in our case study of the European mink. <clears throat> Sorry. Uh, for the case study, I have um, introduced a new concept, Umwelt reversion. Um, I will come to it briefly because from the comparison of European minks' uh, lives in situ and ex situ, we can see several differences in meaning, meaning carriers of food. And the case study uh, will enable us to scrutinize what kind of new objects are introduced in their bas basic. Uh, functional circles, specifically food functional circle. And um, Uxkul actually did not consider what happens in the Umbelton in allo animals when there are changes in the environment. However, our case study indicates uh, the decoupling of the environment and the allo animal, which are accompanied by major changes in the Umbelton of the minks. Thus, we need kind of a more contemporary approach to this um, but still kind of exculian uh, approach to, to tackle this issue. And Morten Donnesson directed his attention to exactly this aspect and created the notion of Umbel transition, uh, which he defined as elastic systematic change within the life cycle of a being considered from an ontogenetic, phylogenetic or cultural perspective. Uh, what we discovered with our research is a special case of Umbel transition. Which, which I said uh, I will call Umwelt reversion. So I define it as a process where an animal or a population of animals return to a previous state of, of configuration of Umwelt after going through a considerable alteration in it. For example, regarding the four main functional circles. And I would describe it as a reversion uh, because it's a situation where an animal or population animals or populations Umwelt has been altered due to external factors, for example, captive conditions, habituation, or, or some other anthropogenic factors that have caused considerable changes in the Umwelt of an animal or population. But upon returning to the external factors to their previous state, the Umwelt of an animal or population reverses in a way that uh, the pre-existing meaning carriers and meanings are reacquired. So now I come to this um, case study. So again, if you, if you remember the uh, diet differences, then we can see tremendous differences in ex, ex situ and in situ conditions. Uh, for example, in ex situ conditions, there is very little live prey, fish, crayfish, and there is no minced meat or vitamin supplements uh, after the release of the minks which makes us uh, question about the strength between the object of food and the meaning carrier. So when the, when the minks are uh, being reintroduced, there is a transition period. Uh, they have these 40 square meter enclosures on the river banks uh, in situ, where they uh, give birth to their offsprings. Uh, they live there through summer and in the fall, the, the, basically the enclosure door is opened and they can come and go freely until they decide to leave the place. So this is called a soft release. And in this transition period, they are still fed with defrosting rodents and mince, minced meat. They can also catch occasional insects, amphibians, or even uh, fish that happen to go through their enclosures. Um, and this is also supported by one of the inter interviewees, a landowner, who had the mink, mink enclosure on his land and he concurred that the stream flowing through the enclosure has spikes, river burbots, and eels, which are some of the preferred fish by the mink. And the same interview also confessed that his son who fishes uh, took much of his catch to the minks. 
If here we can see the tendency to offer minks more natural food, then there is also a counterexample where a mink family, after leaving their transition enclosure, settled in a harbor seawall next to a pizza restaurant. And the owner of the restaurant told us several different stories about his summer with the minks. And I quote, the mink wanted to drag away the flower bag, but since her teeth are sharp, they penetrated the bag and the whole kitchen was covered in flour. And the mink also dragged away some pizza crusts under the hood of the car and stole food from customer tables. And this certain inclination toward uh, anthropogenic food sources is also echoed by uh, other interviewees. For example, another landowner recalls the mink climbing on the table in their home yard during his child's birthday. And uh, uh, a retired pensioner remembers feeding the mink with grilled chicken and perhaps uh, the most peculiar instance is the mink uh, who got drunk on vodka. As, as the livestock farmer told us, and I quote, since the mink liked to play with the vodka bottle, the builders played a trick on her by pouring a bit of, on, a bit, a bit of it on the ground. She tasted it and ran to the steam room to drink some water. Uh, there were also several recorded cases, uh, as was told to us by an environmental officer, uh, about minks raiding hen houses, which is also an unusual food source for um, um, in situ born uh, mink. But these examples that we uh, gained from the interviewees help to illustrate that uh, there is a very wide range of objects that possess the meaning carrier of food for the reintroduced captive born European minks. And it seems that they freely incorporate the new objects uh, to the functional circle of food. What is interesting here is that the described instances mainly occurred with minks that were born in the zoo uh, or in the breeding facility and brought to the island, but not with their offsprings who were born already in Hiuma. In fact, their offsprings were too cautious of humans to take advantage of these anthropogenic uh, resources. Um, so uh, the claim that captive born minks use unusual food sources upon reintroduction uh, but cease to do so after some period is also supported by relevant literature. So in this um, figure that I have presented, we can see uh, the typical objects of food for wild minks uh, as represented by in situ diet. And when the animals were caught and transported to um, captive environment, a major umwelt transition in the lives of the animals uh, took place the diet was also completely replaced with a new one, uh, which indicates that the meaning carrier of food uh, denoted totally different objects. Since the mink survived and thrived, we can assume that the connection between the meaning carrier and the object is not strong. Uh, when the minks were introduced, another major onward transition took place. Uh, they were kept on on-site enclosures, new meaning carriers, or actually new objects are added to the umwelten of these specific subjects. And after leaving the enclosure, they are free to introduce additional objects of food. And thus during this transition period, the diversity of objects in the functional circle of the food is the largest. But what is interesting is that after the transitional period, when the minks have gotten accustomed to in situ life, we can see that they exclude certain objects of food, uh, mainly anthropogenic resources. And the relationship between the meaning carrier and the object of the given functional cycle um, becomes similar, or we can even say identical to the one pre-existing pre in in situ conditions. So in this case, the umbel to version is evident and as pertaining to the meaning carrier and objects in the functional circle of food, we can see that after the transitional period, the minks require a suitable configuration of this aspect uh, to manage in their native habitat. So uh, I think what is also important to, to kind of stress here is um, the mink's own active part or agency in this Umbel version, because the anthropogenic resources are attainable for them by continued feeding, grading the hen houses, inserting, to, inserting themselves into human settlements. They um, they interpret the environment in a way to opt for other food resources more compatible with their native habitat. I have a similar analysis uh, with the functional circle of enemy, 
where I look at the relations between humans and minks. And here the object of the functional circle that is human uh, stays the same, but the meaning carrier changes. But I don't think I have much time to go into it. Uh, I also have, uh, with this case study, the supporting kind of information uh, or knowledge from the local people where they can basically uh, basically bring out exactly the time when when there were a lot of minks that they could see and now when they wait when they go for example a nature photographer told us that when he goes to the um, uh, forest to take pictures of different animals he can see a lot of uh, minks footprints but he has not seen the minks for uh, for years now so this kind of uh, association between humans and and minks has also returned to its previous um, previous state and obviously these two functional circles of, of food and human as an enemy uh, are are quite connected and uh, maybe maybe um, even though i i i uh, tackled only kind of one of the functional circles i can i can probably say that through the analysis of umwelt uh, when we employ the concepts of functional circle, uh, meaning carrier, and Umwelt transition also, it is possible to ex ex explicate the changes that take place in allo animals' lives, thanks to their ag agency. Uh, and I think that we have revealed that the case of the European mink, uh, the functional circle of food, undergoes a transformation that can be described as uh, Umwelt reversion. And I think I will leave it at that, so you will have time for questions. Thank you, Nelly. Uh, I have one question, if I may. Um, I was wondering, uh, what's the general attitudes of the interviewees uh, towards these animals? Um, well, it was a quite a difficult project, because usually when you see these kind of reintroduction projects, then there are conflicts with animals. But with Mink, there are basically no con <laughs> conflicts because he is uh, avoiding people. Uh, with him, there are no major restrictions that come along, so the people are still kind of able to use the, their land. And uh, people do not think about him often, uh, which is good in a sense that it's, uh, the, the Mink has become a natural part of the environment. So we don't, usually we don't think of the animals who have become a natural part of our environment. So positive, mostly positive because of the, the cuteness of the animal and the fame that comes with, uh, with the European mink. The, he's one of the uh, most endangered uh, small uh, predators in, in Europe. And uh, mostly there is only in France, there is a little habitat in Spain and then in Hiuma in Estonia, where they have a natural habitat. So uh, the people of Hiuma are very proud when, when uh, minks are mentioned because they are always mentioned in tandem with, with their island. Thank you. Uh, any other questions? If not, then uh, thank you on my part for listening. Thank you very much. Um, so the third speaker today is Katarzyna uh, Machtil. Sorry yes. if I missed. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Very good. <laughs> and her presentation is titled Semiotics of the Human and Natural Subject, Semiotically Viewed Culture-Nature Relations in the Age of Post-Anthropocentrism. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. And now I will share my screen. Uh, can you tell me, please, can you see it? Yes. Great. Uh, okay, maybe I will just um, make here. Oh yeah, it would be better, I guess. Um, okay, so um, thank you once again for the introduction. Uh, here is my, uh, the topic of my talk once again. Um, as you can uh, tell uh, by looking at this uh, topic, you can say that um, I am going to um, cross some fields of uh, knowledge and not even of knowledge because I'm going to um, refer to the, the field of design. So uh, I would like to 
juxtapose two main perspectives, the culture and uh, culture studies and biosemiotics. And uh, as a um, cultural semiotician, um, who, am I, uh, who I am myself, uh, the relations uh, between nature and culture are uh, of the highest interest, are the, the crucial ones. And um, uh, here are just main points of my talk. I would like to go through if, uh, if I have a, a suitable amount of time. Uh, so first of all, uh, very shortly, very briefly, I would like to uh, tell something about nature, culture or nature culture uh, relations are this uh, binary opposition or in separated unity uh, then the, i would like to move uh, to the issue of a subject the human and natural and the, the word and is here in brackets as um, uh, you will see in a few minutes uh, it is a um, not so easy uh, a question a so simple question to say that we can talk about human and natural as two opposite uh, types of subjects. Um, finally, I'm going to um, move to the section of my talk, uh, which can be um, perceived by you as a quite uh, different from the rest of my presentation. Um, as I'm going to present you very briefly at the project called Zeopolis, uh, which consists of uh, two different exhibitions and then a printed uh, book. Um, yeah, and uh, just to uh, end this uh, introduction, I would like to uh, introduce you the main aim of my talk, and it is to apply or juxtapose some scientific, that is, in this case, biosemiotic ideas with an artistic practice, which is, in this case, design. Uh, okay, so um, I would like to, uh, as I said already, uh, introduce uh, some uh, very uh, fundamental um, ponderings um, uh, according or in reference to nature culture relations. And I would like to um, discuss nature culture relations in two main uh, basic fields the one of anthropology and the, the second one of biosemiotics. And uh, the, I can say the motto of my talk uh, is the quotation from Sibiok, uh, who wrote that uh, the minuscule segment of nature some anthropologists grandly compartmentalize uh, as culture. So in this perspective, a culture is just a small part of a nature. And this is the perspective I, I would like to maintain during my whole talk. Um, uh, as you will see in a few minutes, uh, my presentation consists of uh, many quotations, especially from uh, Paul Cobley's book, um, Biosemiotic, uh, Cultural Implications of Biosemiotic. Uh, as I uh, can uh, say that um, this is a kind of a complex um, monography of the topic I am interested in uh, recently. So the, the task of biosemiotics is to make more porous the boundary between living nature and culture, the sciences and the humanities. As such, it is a challenge to the view of humans as exceptional in nature. Um, so the, the basic um, assumption here is that semiosis is a process that takes part across the realm of nature. And since I said that the culture is just a small part of nature, we can say that semiosis goes across the realm of nature and culture or nature culture as a one uh, separated unity. And uh, what is also very important here is that uh, biosemiotics abolishes or um, cancels uh, binarisms like individual collectivity, agent, subject, verbal, non-verbal, human, non-human, mind, matter, culture, living nature, and so on and so on. And you will see um, how uh, design uh, responses to such uh, scientific ideas. Okay, um, 
as it was announced in the abstract of my talk, uh, I would like to just stop very briefly in the um, concept of subject presented by Rota Rasti in the field of his existential semiotics. Um, of course, Rota Rasti um, is not a biosemiotician. Uh, however, his um, his project is quite closely to some, of course, to some um, ideas and concepts presented in the field of biosemiotics, and of course, to some extent. Uh, so first of all, uh, the main difference between uh, Tarasti's uh, project and the one of biosemiotics considered in general, I don't want to go into details and to, uh, to, um, to talk about some different uh, currents within biosemiotics. It is not a place and time here to do so. Uh, so just in general. Um, Erotarasti, um, the main difference between Tarasti's project and biosemiotics considered in general, uh, is that uh, Tarasti um, pays attention to the human subject and uh, the, the human human. So it is not just a natural subject in general, but his concept is limited to humans. Um, but uh, what are the uh, some common points uh, of uh, his project and uh, the, the biosemiotic thinking, way of thinking? First of all, um, Tarasti um, focuses on the issue of choices and decisions the subject uh, makes. So the subject is not a passive uh, entity, but he's got his own his or her own um, agency, uh, make decisions, uh, has desires, uh, and so on. Uh, it is, of course, based on some modalities as the existential semiotics uh, fundaments uh, lie in uh, Grammarian semiotics, we can say in some uh, modal uh, semiotics as well. Uh, so, uh, as Tarasti writes, the subject makes choices in relation to the surrounding environment. Since these surrounding structures are essentially arbitrary and not di dictated by nature, they can be changed. And it is the subject which has the power to change them. On this point, that the subject can make its own possibilities, biosemiotics and existential semiotics agree. Yes, uh, the choice uh, possibilities and interpretation treated here like a keywords uh, are of the highest interest of uh, the research, uh, for example, conducted by Kalevikul. Um, <laughs> I know that it is uh, absolutely uh, not necessary to introduce uh, this, um, <laughs> this researcher here. Uh, so just a very short quotation about the, the choice uh, and about the subject in relation to uh, the the ability to making choices. Um, yes, and the main, uh, I, I just have a short look at, at the, the, the clock. Okay, now the natural subject, the main part of my talk. Um, in the field of biosemiotics, a natural subject is considered, uh, the human is considered as a natural subject. So we can say that natural subject is uh, the, the wider uh, term than the human subject. Um, and uh, here we've got some uh, basic uh, um, terms from the field of biosemiotics. Uh, first of all, we've got the, the concept of the Umwelt introduced uh, just a few minutes before. Uh, I'm uh, very grateful that uh, the, the experts uh, of biosemiotics, uh, which were uh, talking before me, uh, did it. So um, yeah, I, I'm in a very uh, comfortable situation and I don't need to, uh, to talk about it um, in details uh, as it was just um, made uh, just a few minutes before. Uh, yes, so um, yeah, the next slide. Um, it deals with uh, the concepts of subjectivity that embrace the concept of choice, agency, and flexibility, 
whilst retaining an anti-humanist perspective on the limits to the human freedom. And it is also very important for me as the anti-humanist, uh, that is uh, the post-humanism, post-anthropocentrism uh, perspectives are of the highest interest in my uh, presentation and in, in its final part will be uh, presented in, in details. So, um, yeah, agency. Um, as we can uh, tell uh, by the um, previous presentation about the European Mink, uh, we all know that agency is not the characteristic of humans only, and biosemiotics turns towards agency in the natural world. And here we've got the short quotation from uh, Hofmeyer about the amoeba, who, uh, which also uh, has its agency. Uh, so we can uh, talk about agency even on the level of the, the self, the, 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 the cell itself. I'm sorry. Um, okay. Um, what is also uh, important and will uh, refer to the last part of my presentation is that organisms perceive, interpret and act in the environment in ways which creatively and unpredictably change the whole setting for selection and, uh, and evolution. So it is also close to some ideas presented by Tarasti. I talked about uh, a few minutes ago uh, that the, the agent uh, has its power to change its setting. It is not a passive uh, individual, a passive uh, entity, but it has uh, its own um, agency, its own um, power to change its uh, environment. Okay, and some more quotations um, dealing with uh, the, the concept of semantic scaffolding uh, and the Umwelt once again. Uh, you can just have a look at them. I'm not going to read them out loud. Um, so, um, it is all about the uh, agent um, ability to um, interact uh, actively with its uh, surrounding, with its um, environment. Uh, so, um, uh, once again, uh, some more uh, remarks on uh, binarism abolition. Um, binarism includes organism environment, and for humans, language, brain, cultural, biology, agent, subject, loses some of its purchase as agency, is shown to exist across nature, uh, as agency, I'm sorry, as agency is shown to exist across nature, and the kind of subjectivity of selfhood derives from reactions which take place at the level of the cell. And um, mm, uh, the, the, um, the struggle with binarisms uh, is of the highest importance for um, post-anthropocentrism perspective. That's the reason I mention it here um, once again. Uh, okay, and slowly going outside the, the biosemiotics, um, I will going to move to anti-humanism and then uh, post-anthropocentrism. Here we've got the, another quote from uh, Paul Cobley uh, on anti-humanism and anti-humanistic perspective when it comes to biosemiotics. Um, it is, of course, based on the notion of human agency. Um, and um, uh, the, the assumption that humans are within the products of semiosis that make up the objects of the humanities. Um, yeah. Um, here we've got two, uh, two, con two, two notions, um, stress especially as a keyword uh, for my talk. That is, um, these are humanism and individualism. And as we can see here uh, in this quote, both humanism and individualism separately and together are rendered incompatible with biosemiotics repeat finding of continuity of science and continuity across nature. And um, both humanism and individualism are uh, the, the ones 
uh, the post-anthropocentric perspective is uh, struggling with. So, um, post-anthropocentrism, uh, here we are um, absolutely outside the biosemiotic um, way of thinking, as uh, we got uh, here some more philosophical and anthropological um, perspective presented here. And, uh, so, mm, just very briefly, what is the difference between post-humanism and post-anthropocentrism? As these two uh, perspectives are uh, close to each other, uh, the main difference is that post-humanism is based on philosophy, cultural studies, history, and classical humanities, whilst post-anthropocentrism adds to those fields also science and technology studies, and as you uh, know very well, uh, the main representative of the science and technology studies is Bruno Latour, uh, then ecology, biogenetics, and animal rights issues. So post-anthropocentrism is more extended perspective, we can say. Um, yes. And uh, going to the last part of my presentation, I hope I have some few minutes left uh, for doing it. Um, I would like to uh, introduce the, um, uh, the division between uh, bios and zoe. Uh, these are two types of life uh, which uh, are mentioned both by Paul Cobley in his book on biosemiotics, but also uh, this, uh, oppos this opposition is crucial for some uh, post-anthropocentrism, uh, post-anthropocentric uh, ponderings. So bios is a life uh, which is a life of an individual of a group, uh, and it is it has its boundaries, it has its uh, beginning and and uh, end. While Zoe is just a life itself, uh, like a vitalistic um, power of living. And the Zoe is um, common for all natural subjects. Um, okay, and um, what about the, the last main point and at the same time the last part of my presentation? Um, I would like to say something to introduce you, um, a project called uh, Zoepolis, Building the Human and Non-Human uh, Community. Um, it was conducted uh, in Poland, uh, so it is a kind of a local one. Um, it consists of two main uh, parts. First were two different exhibitions and uh, secondly, uh, there were uh, a book uh, in a printed version. Uh, you can see this book here in these um, pictures. Uh, it is, of course, the cover of it. Um, and uh, what is very interesting about the book itself is that uh, on the uh, title page, uh, we don't have um, something which is very standard for, book, um, for books. The, the list of editors, we've got the uh, inscription, the threads into interwinted by. So it is a, a reference to uh, some Tim Ingold's or Bruno Latour um, concepts about the entanglement and, uh, yeah, about the entanglement. <laughs> okay, let's uh, start in this place. And uh, when we've got the end of the foreword, uh, where usually we have um, the place and date of, uh, of writing such a foreword, we've got here the inscription Earth 2020, not, for example, Warsaw or uh, some other uh, city, name of a city, but Earth 2020. Um, okay, and um, here are just uh, the, the basic fundaments of uh, this Zoepolis project. Uh, you can see that um, it was aimed to create a human non-human uh, community. It was of course made in reference to concept uh, from the field of post 
uh, Humanism and Post Anthropocentrism, introduced by Donna Haraway and Bruno Latour, um, especially. Um, and as it is a project from the field of design, um, the um, basic uh, aspect, the basic element of this whole uh, Zoopolis um, community um, are objects, artifacts, architecture, and various spaces which are treated here as uh, mediators, uh, which can uh, mediate between uh, different uh, natural subjects. Uh, and of course, this project uh, deals with uh, dualisms uh, like human, other animals, nature, culture, wildness, civilization, and so on and so on. All these were mentioned uh, a few minutes ago uh, in the field of biosemiotics. Okay, so um, the Zoopolis uh, exhibitions um, maintain the perspective on non-anthropocentric design, non-anthropocentric design based on bindings and knots, um, stressing the non-human agency. Um, yeah, I know that I'm running out of time, so uh, yeah, just very, uh, just very quickly. Uh, two uh, exhibitions first uh, took place in 2017 and the second uh, two years after it. Uh, so the first uh, exhibition uh, was entitled uh, Zoopolis Design for Plants and Animals, while the second one uh, was entitled Design for Weeds and Pests. So there, were, there was a small change of perspective. Um, and the first uh, exhibition took place in a gallery, uh, whilst the second one took place in a, in a building, uh, which was very strictly connected to its surrounding. It was um, uh, uh, settled by the river. Um, the, the nature, um, there were an open door, let's say it metaphorically, an open door for, for the nature to come in to this building. So there were some, um, uh, different and non-human um, inhabitants in this uh, building. Uh, okay, and um, maybe just here you've got some um, uh, description of the first exhibition from the uh, exhibition's website. Um, so the main question is, can we think of design whose subject would be non-humans, plants and animals? So it is a very uh, mm, enormous change of perspective, as in 20th century, there was a human-centered design. And now the question is, can we design for plants and humans? But uh, what is very important here is that it is not about um, designing something from the perspective of a human, like the gadgets we can buy in pet shops, for example. Uh, but it is a um, designing in uh, constant interaction with plants and animals and other non-human uh, entities who have their own agency, rights, desires, and so on and so on. Um, okay. Uh, so maybe, um, uh, as I don't want to uh, um, to talk too uh, long, just um, a very, I would skip maybe this slide. And uh, yeah, uh, so um, the, generally about these two uh, exhibitions, what, I, what uh, can be said is that it is all about the coexistence and cooperation and about admitting the agency and subjectivity of non-humans. Uh, very um, uh, interesting uh, situation occurs, um, occurred uh, during the, the second exhibition. Uh, you can see in the third point of the, in the slide, uh, as there was a vernissage wine and uh, the, the organizers um, uh, didn't want uh, the, uh, the fruit flights to sink in a glass full of wine, 
uh, they just uh, gave them a special um, glass dish filled with this wine just to uh, drink safely uh, without uh, taking the risk of sinking in the glass. So even the fruit flies were uh, considered here as uh, the subjects uh, we have to take care of. Um, okay, and just the, the, the variant of my presentation here, you've got, I'm sorry, in Polish, uh, the list of authors of these exhibitions. And uh, what is uh, very interesting here is that here we've got the names of artists, scientists, and so on, but among them, we've got names of uh, species. So they are just treated equally uh, here in the list. And um, uh, maybe in the part of discussion, I will uh, go to this uh, examples uh, from this uh, exhibition. Uh, yeah, and concluding remarks, remarks are just uh, like that, um, that biosemiotics and design can meet in some uh, crossing points and uh, reflect on each other. And uh, since uh, the authors of the project, Zoopolis, uh, did not refer to biosemiotics, I found it interesting to uh, brought their perspective of post-anthropocentrism, adding to it uh, the uh, optics uh, of biosemiotics. Um, okay. Thank you very much, and I'm sorry for uh, being uh, to, to extend the, the limit of time. We have time for a quick question, if there is any. Yes, please. Thanks for that um, extraordinarily interesting paper. I, I just had a, a question about um, the, the difference between animal design and, and human design. It, it, is it the case that human design is based more on projection? It's based more on uh, what possibilities there might be? I'm thinking uh, in particular of this, um, this classic idea of um, a building with columns and I forget what they call that bit at the top, the architrave or whatever it is in, uh, in architecture, you know, and that idea um, is supposedly based on the first, the first dwellings for humans. Um, but actually it wouldn't work. You need, you need to build them out of stone in order for, the, for that to work. Um, so obviously it's a kind of projection in, in some way. It's not, it's not harking back to a, um, a, a real primitive state of, uh, of architecture. So sh surely that's what all humans do, but animals are doing something else when they um, engage in design. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, uh, thank you for this question. I guess that um, the main point of the Zoopolis project uh, was that um, to show that the design, uh, the, the human design, of course, is um, is uh, very specific as it is um, uh, based on some uh, human de desires, needs, and so on and so on. And when uh, humans uh, started to um, uh, to think about the uh, the um, design for animals it is um, very um, often uh, limited to some, um, let's say, uh, the, the um, uh, nature, um, wildlife conservation, as we can see here, onto consumerism. Uh, and the, the aim of the project of Zoopolis uh, was to show that um, maybe not that animals can design some things for themselves, but how can uh, the, the matter itself, how can architecture spaces, urban spaces especially, um, be a kind of mediator between human and non-human uh, entities? Uh, that is, uh, 
we don't expect uh, some animals, for example, to design something for themselves, uh, but it is more about um, the changing the perspective and show that uh, the non-human entities has their own have their own uh, power and um, agency to um, to be in some kind of an interactions with humans, like a grass uh, in some um, concrete in urban spaces, for example, uh, some uh, trees uh, which roots uh, are breaking. Uh, the the, um, the sidewalks, for example. So uh, it is not just that some animals are designing something for themselves, but that uh, human perspective is more sensitive um, to some uh, desires and needs uh, the non-human agents uh, have. Thank you. It's it's fascinating. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But unfortunately, we don't have much time left, and we have to move on to the next presenter, Chris uh, Chris Santos, on the rationale of a unified semiotic approach to this debate with Morris on Peirce's semiotics. And uh, thank you, Katarzyna. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I know. Sorry. Uh, hi, all. Uh, let me close the camera and uh, come, up, ca come back again at the end. It feels more comfortable for my presentation. And uh, because of some latency, it uh, works better for my computer. Mm, I think, Katarzyna, you need to stop uh, uh, sharing your screen. Oh, yeah. I'm sorry. Yeah. Thank you. You see the presentation? Yeah. Uh, so hi all, uh, again, I'm Christophos Boutonos and I have a PhD from Cyprus University of Technology, the Department of Multimedia and Graphic Arts. In the methodology of my study, I synthesized a semiotic model that guided the formulation of prescriptive, prescriptive guidelines which can be found useful for the design and evaluation in virtual heritage. The model was named Case Study Semiosphere from the usage of Byzantine art as a case study. The model encapsulates the overall background theory of the applied approach, passing now to the mantle of a more theoretical, wholly semiotic and philosophic in ancient theme, as the title of the presentation indicates. It will be explained how this new approach taken the implications of previous projects in connection primarily to Pierce and Morris philosophies, and by extension to Lodma cultural semiotics, is shifting to a new direction. The move towards a new semioethic approach inspired the rationale originating on Dewey's debate with Morris on Pierce's semiotics. The new project continues as an outgrowth of the previous one, as I said. A synthesis of Pierce, Morris, and Lotman with a cultural semiotic, semiotic aesthetic theorization leading to the formulation of prescriptive design guidelines and the methodology for the evaluation of a virtual heritage application, a virtual museum of Byzantine art intending its pedagogical administration to young pupils. Our rationale deals in this paper with a polemic critique exercised from Dewey to Morris, accusing him for misinterpreting Pierce's science theory and overturning his philosophy. From the theoretical justifications of the work, we aim to shape a new theoretical framework, a semioethic approach, including the task of redefining the notion of biosemiotics within a new set semiotic approach. In our previous approach, cultural, cultural semiotics and semiotic aesthetics with their semiotic tools and terminologies are used in combination 
and on this ground, we will show how we advance our endeavor. Now let's discuss the rationale of our semiotic approach and the main points we shall briefly comment. The status of the interpretant in the behavioral th theory. I'm sorry. So we, we shall discuss the status of the interpretant in the behavioral theory of Morris and the, and the inversion of pure science theory going through crucial elements that we find important. Firstly, our study discusses the, sub, the, the subtlety of Morris answers to Dewey's critique with regards both the justification of our previous approach and the outgrowth of the new one, a semioethic approach. It also includes analysis by semioticians or other writers Aware of, Morris aware of Morris' work and of the confrontation that took place. For example, Petrilli, Ponzio, and Moreno. For example, Moreno, although he takes sides with Dewey, he admits that although he could not undermine Morris' analysis, he had to strike at the assumption that that analysis wasn't required, but also, but also by other means, we shall explain short, shortly. Petrilli and Ponzio, on the other hand, while they indicated the technical inconsistencies of Dewey, they didn't deal with the negative influence and the real inverse of peace pragmatism in American philosophy or inconsistencies we would like to explore in the proposed semiotic approach. In our paper, we acknowledge that the crude concerning the address dispute, besides Morris' correctness on foundational level, contains the problem of the usage of peace's theory from Dewey towards wrong directions, a philosophy and cosmotheory endangering actually Pierce's own ethical motives. This is something confessed by Pierce himself, who actually blamed Dewey as one of the kidnappers of his theory. So let us first turn to the very important element within science, within science processes, the interpretant, seen from what is connected strongly with an interpreter from the role of the interpreter as an organism when something functions as a sign. Due in opposition, he thought of interpreter as prescinding from sign interpreter relation and in connection to a value theory, rather abstractly, we would say. From our analysis, it's taken that from the concepts of usage of signs proposed by Morris, the informative, the evaluative, the initiative, and systemic, the incitive and valuative are considered of paramount importance with the linkage to signification. Very important also are considered the relations of sign and value, signs and values studied as the dimensions of the conceived object and operative values together with dimension of signification and action, the designative, the prescriptive, and the appraisive corresponding to three types of action, perceptual, manipulatory, and consumatory. Especially for this presentation, we would like to give emphasis on the evaluative usage of the signs closely related with ways of signification. It is also important to give you a brief outline of our previous applied approach as a cultural semiotic, semiotic aesthetic and its methodology explained in connection with the rationale and the direction on how it forms the time as semioethic. Please pay, pay attention to the words design and evaluation as they imply the objective of our research in terms of its pragmatic results and question set, but also they incite with their formation rationale and the new semioethic pers perspective. So in our PhD dissertation, we were able to provide design guidelines and assisting users' valuation or axiology, if we may use such a philosophical notion, for the preservation of cultural heritage and cultural transformation resource. The last notion, coming from Lodman, is related with a pedagogic intention in, its, in, in this project, assisting users of visual heritage appreci appreciate the value of Byzantine art 
for promoting their cultural kinship with the past Byzantine identity, but, but mostly its religious component. Doing so, interpreters' users had to utter underground and experimental exploration, evaluation, given an undertaken evaluation experiment where we had to recall their understanding of their existing cultural space and influence from other semiotic systems. The methodology came from Morris due to the correspondence with his own philosophical account for evaluation. Evaluative inquiry seeks for objects to which preference is to be given and for course, courses of action that will meet, meet the value problems imposed by the inquiry. Within the cultural semiotic or semiospheric framework of the study, culture is defined by Lodman and Tartu School as a system of science or map of sphere, hypothetically creating a closed area that depicts a common cultural background as opposed to a larger whole and a guess non culture, defined as that not belonging to a particular religion, not having access to some knowledge, or not sharing some type of life and behavior. We can also add that the semiosphere is the result and the condition of the development of culture, a space that appears any form, that, that appears any form of activity, contact, or process that involve, involves science and makes semiosis happening. Our evaluation methodology holds also due to Morris understanding that values are consumatory properties or objects of, of, of different value situations, actions, relative to human preferential behavior that, that, an, that, are untable, uh, that are untainable for analysis. Edge classification in our evaluation experiment is a simple descriptive method for evaluating prefer preferential behavior values of different age groups rather than applying inferential statistical methods. By choosing these options, we are more focused on the semiotic and philosophical analysis of the inferences drawn from the semiotic analysis of, of data. Our analysis of the previous mentioned manifestations so shows how cultural heritage consists of dynamically interpretive and axiological signs manifesting as follows with the assistance of virtual heritage. Based on the diagram of our conceptualized semiotic model, case study semiosphere, signs of category firstness or signs of in semiosphere one, which are qualitative signs of cultural heritage with virtual technologies and various digital techniques design techniques inspired from formulated prescriptive guidelines are assisted becoming into signs of secondness or signs of semiosphere two. And finally, to interpretive and axiological signs giving meaning and value for cultural heritage in the minds of interpreters, users, or signs in semiosphere three. Our analysis of the previous mentioned manifestations show how cultural heritage consists, consists of dynamically interpretive and axiological size, signs manifesting as follows with the assistance of, of virtual heritage. Based on the diagram of our conceptualized semiotic model, signs of category firstness or signs in semiosphere one, which are qualitative signs of cultural heritage with virtual technologies and various design techniques, and finally, to become, as we said, to interpretive and axiological science, giving meaning, meanings to the minds of the interpreters, users of science in, semio, in the first semiosphere. Sorry for the repetition here. Now, some prolegomena to the semio, semioethic approach. From my doctoral dissertation, such a thing in semiotic aesthetic terms from the theory of Morris, which has significance, otherwise value to human artifacts, can be used to help us analyze successfully the relation between signs and values, a relation that contains a natural or biosemiotic origin element, but a strictly anthroposemiotic. We should seek and analyze, if possible, with the best precision we can. What else could be employed to think of this cryptic matter apart seeing it in relation? Morris gives the name designado and comprises the value situation or situations under which a man or an animal can respond. 
respectively to linguistics, to linguistic or non-linguistic science. But if we can recall again Dewey's position against Morris, this element is, is nonsense, together with the statement that quality or value in peace could not be individual or general. As we have seen elsewhere, together with the withering of Morris theory of values on another occasion, a paper with the title on Peace's theory of quality, in his effort to develop his own theory of value, Dewey becomes harsh again in defending his own position against another writer who tried to analyze Peace's theory on values in connection to meaning, ma meaning making. But yet, preferential behavior about science objects and their sign behavior, their ability to signify, manifest within specific courses of action and value situations we have seen in our cultural semiotic, semiotic aesthetic approach conceptualized within the sign value manifestations of the developed semiotic model. Simultaneously, the interpreter that, that received the interest from Yui to proceed in his polemic and speak about the reversal of Pisces theory for his own merit for the evolution of his pragmatism, we could say in adherence to Morris that it names and signifies a certain kind of effect of a sign on an interpreter, a tendency to action, but often it may not signify and remain hidden. That will be the case where a sign or signs remain hidden or undeveloped, as the same circumstances may have it circumstances or value situations under which one will respond, as he or she will dispose to respond because, because of science. From a brief consultation from our semiotic model, you may observe how Morris science theory can match pieces theory, as well as Lotman's semiosphere in a relative manner. The interpreter and interpreter can exist simultaneously, and the interpreter cannot exceed a part in three relative relation as in Peel's words, an influence not big in any way resolvable into action between pairs. Signs in relation to themselves, their sign vehicles, either develop or remain unheeded, or degenerate at the stage of fairness, not, develop, not developing within fairness through secondness. Signification or sign behavior in, in action can be analyzed therefore with reference to each individual sign from peers, seeing them how they imagine in their typology with the dimensions of the conceived object and operative values, reflecting their analogous sign dimensions of signification and action, respectively their signification dimension with designative, prescriptive, and their present types of signific signification, Corresponding to three types, three types of, of, of action, the, the perceptual, manipulatory, and consumatory. The first ax axis describes signs in relation to themselves according to, to peers, or they express the relation of perceived interpreters towards the values they express, they express, express or not, according to Morris. Now let us proceed with some final explanations about what happens with the interpreter in connection to, to Dewey and Morris dispute and the semi-ethic perspective of our new approach and another visual conceptualization for the sake of simplicity. Conceived values, the designatum or qualities to be interpreted, despite their signification as linguistic signs, their true understanding, is a matter of human experience and something else we mentioned in a while. Consider, however, a line of interrelation between qualities and feelings that for you it can be thought logically as the double barrenness of experience taken by another pragmatist, the philosopher William James, who was a friend of his, and his statement saying, we do not identify quality in terms of feeling. The reverse is the case. Along his logic, 
that can be abstract, abstracted from his basic views of science in relation with values, Dewey actually proclaims his famous pervasive politic concept that bypasses the obstacles or the ambiguity Morris tries to overcome by demonstrating plainly a unity of an experience which is neither exclusively emotional, practical, nor intellectual, but determined by a, by a single pervasive quality. We can wonder though, how conceiving that will be if we are to acknowledge Morris, Morris and Pierce's pains to develop their philosophies and semiotic theories. On the contrary, our proposition lies in our aim to, to develop further our semiotic approach along Pierce's normative philosophy and the three relative relations within the vortex of Boromi and not the semiotic space of culture. Together with Morris, other three party dimensions, if we paraphrase his article, Science, Art, Technology, with Art, Technology, and Science, we continue our research along the lines of an applied research again. However, the focus may shift exclusively on the basis of a philosophical, philosophical theological ground in conjunction to theology as theological semiotics. We have tried also in our PhD, but we aim, but, but we aim to, settle now, to settle it now across the following structure and the context of sem a semiotic approach as follows. I'm sorry, would, would it be possible to wrap it uh, up and maybe uh, come to conclusions? Because unfortunately we are going over, we have gone over time. Okay, I'm, I'm just finished. I need, I, there is only one slide. So mm -hmm. what is the orientation of this new semiotic approach? We are about to reorient re our closeness to Morris and semiotic and semiotics, approaching Petrilli and Ponzio, but not quite alike, even though we take inspiration from them. Due to the reference to Lotman's semiosphere, the proposed approach and the analyzed case study semiosphere, we aim to coincide in some respect with bio, biosphere and biosemiotics, but not quite as Sebiox manifesto of global semiotics. Petrilli and Ponzio semi, semi, semiotics follow Sebiox school of thought. Since we haven't mentioned important specificities with regard to Lotman and cultural semiotics, we'll continue with these sub-disciplines of semiotics that we consider very important. Are we going to continue with, with the applied dimension of the previous approach? We might need to rethink of it and free ourselves from this path and shift entirely to a biosemiotic approach in concordance with semioethics, yet reconsidering from, another, from, reconsidering from another angle of thought. The outgrowth of our approach, including the previous applied project, will turn to a philosophical theological approach with a broader conception of philosophy containing a doctrine of science together with one doctrine of the nature of value, ethical and aesthetic values. Finally, we haven't mentioned specific aspects leading into adverse consequences on Jewish subjects of his influence, like aesthetics and educational philosophy. We need to talk in some details on this real inversion in science theory and philosophy in general, that caused we believe a distortion of ethics in peace pragmatics and of semiotics, semiotics, semiotics as semioethics, Something detailed in our something that will be detailed in our forthcoming paper. Thank you very much. Any comments and suggestions or questions are welcome. Below you can see also relevant relevant papers uh, to this uh, to this work. Um, I, I mean the the previous uh, the, the model with the case study semi or the semi ethic uh, approach that I aim to to develop will be a, a work for for the future. Thank you very much. Any questions? I, I think we we have to stop. You know. <laughs> yeah. Ben, I'm sorry, uh, it's a Zoom time. Uh, to the finish, uh, maybe we can uh, have another uh, uh, question session after the uh, next uh, next panel.
Okay, thank you very much then, and see you later. See you guys. Thank, thank you very, you very much. much. Thank you. Bye.